the Evolution Security Podcast. Hey everybody, welcome to the Evolution Security Podcast. This is Aaron, the lone tactical twin. Eric cannot make it this evening, but I just got back from an amazing class called NPE Counter Robbery with Cecil Birch, Chuck Haggard, and our guest tonight, Daryl Bokey. Now, just if anyone's not sure about that acronym, that means Non-Permissive Environment, NPE Counter Robbery. An excellent, excellent class. And and I took the opportunity to get with Daryl as soon as I could after this class. Because again, I just got back into the house yesterday evening. So Daryl, thanks so much for coming on. Um, how are you doing tonight? I'm tired like you are. <laughs> it's a long weekend. <laughs> yes, it, it was a long weekend, but you know, when you get through doing difficult things in a class like that, you know, and then the wonderful people that you meet and work with, it's elating at the same time. You're you're kind of you're relieved, you're you're tired, but then at the same time you're elated because you went through something difficult. Yeah, and, and you were and, in a great class student-wise, too. You guys had a, a really good mix of people in there. So. Yeah, it was a neat group. And, you know, again, people that show up to classes like this, um, they're usually some of the most well-adjusted people because they're already in a niche of a niche of a student <laughs> market anyway, yeah. right? Yeah. So, but now, before we get into some of the um, information I want to go over with you, Daryl, just in case people aren't familiar with you, could you go ahead and give our audience a background? Yeah, I'll do kind of the short one. Um, so I'm a retired police officer from Southern California. I spent almost 20 years on the job. Uh, I was injured really bad on an on duty, uh, in a, in a fight on duty, uh, that just stacked the inju injuries so hard. They wouldn't let me come back no matter how hard I tried. Um, I did not, I went out kicking and screaming. Um, mm -hmm. during my career, I spent <laughs> 17 years assigned to the SWAT team as a firearms instructor and, uh, armor. Uh, that was a collateral duty. I spent the rest of my time. I worked in patrol division, everything from patrol, uh, crime suppression, uh, proactive shifts, uh, working in vice, uh, spent four years in a helicopter, four years on a bicycle as an FTO for 10 years. Um, so I did a variety of stuff, but it was all out of patrol division. I never had a desk job or an inside job the entire time I was there. So that was all street time. Um, been involved in multiple uh, officer involved shootings. I've been in literally thousands of force incidents. Uh, one of my jobs because of the firearms background is I was involved with a unit that we did the investigations on officer involved shootings. And I handled all the, uh, firearms and ballistic workups on those and all their relative expertise involved in the firearms during a shooting. So I've worked over 75 of those firsthand, uh, as a subject matter expert with the district attorney's office on firearm stuff, tactics, uh, testified as an expert in court numerous times on these type of things. Uh, so yeah, I got a pretty deep background with that. Um, I started in the firearms industry before I was a cop while I was going to college. Um, and then when I retired, well, even when I was on the job, uh, I was working pretty heavy in corporate America as a private investigator, uh, doing some pretty heavyweight stuff for some major, uh, corporations. When I retired, I started getting into the security side of things. I worked, uh, numerous executive protection details. Uh, I usually specialized on people who had actual death threats against them. Uh, I broke my celebrity rule for one celebrity family in fam Hollywood. I was with for a couple of years with, with their kids. Um, and then, uh, 
wife died of cancer. I had an eight year old. We end up moving to Texas where my parents mm. live. And, uh, the uh, and then started working a whole bunch of corporate security stuff and firearms instruction here in Texas. Partnered up with uh, Wayne Dobbs to form Hardwire Tactical Shooting, which we've been teaching under that banner for ten years. And we specialize. We have a lot of stuff we do. Most people know us for how we teach uh, safety uh, and how yeah. we teach. Uh, threat assessment and kind of the shooting process is a little different than everybody else. And that's kind of what we're known for. And then I'm kind of back doing a ton of security work again as well. So at every level, I, I work everything from uniform stuff to uh, like, you know, uniformed off duty cop type stuff to working again back inside a sort of deep inside corporate America where I, you know, I told the clash, I, do a lot of stuff where they want cops, but they don't let us, uh, but they don't want you armed. So that you're working inside, inside the same environments, uh, that a lot of our students have to deal with. Yes. Well, I can tell you spending the, the three days I did with you that, that it was clear through that whole time that you had a really deep and broad, uh, experience level so now real quick so i'll tell you what i wish i had my phone recording all weekend <laughs> because you know that, that there were wisdom bombs dropping all over the place from you guys i i took as many notes as i could and if there was something that hit me real hard i made sure i wrote it down but just to just to give a real cursory level of of what we went through this weekend, and of course, the, the class again was um, you and then um, Cecil Birch from Immediate Action Combatives, who who primarily taught the MUC, or as it's known, Managing Unknown Contacts. That's, of course, the verbalization all the way up to a possible physical encounter. And then we had Chuck Haggard there from Agile Training and Consulting. He did an awesome lesson in in pepper spray, which I've wanted to take some um, lessons from him in pepper spray for a long time. It was, you know, somewhat abbreviated on both of those fronts, but at the same time, I mean, just great information. And I'm going to go ahead and take another class from Chuck whenever I can. And then now, of course, then then it's you. You're so it was Cecil on the muck. It was Chuck in the less than lethals. The as he says it in between a harsh word and a firearm. And then you were the primary instructor on the firearms front. Now, but again, I got to clarify too that all of you guys were giving giving lecture information on how you integrate all of these things that we were going on through the weekend in non-permissive environments so if, if, you know if i can interrupt you aaron real quick just yeah. kind of for the crowd so they understand sort of the basis of the class the reason we call it that is most people we call average earth people or normal human beings out there generally a lot of folks work in job environments where they can't be armed you know the reason mm -hmm. they're leaving home every day is to go to a job that doesn't allow firearms or is certainly not big on them or into an environment. You know, they're not, a lot of folks are not working at a you know local gun shop or a training company or something where they, yeah, you, know, you can carry whatever you want all day. So most people end up either being restricted of no guns, no firearms, no weapons to uh, frowned upon or not socially acceptable. So that's sort of why we term the class. We want you to come to this, with gear su gear suited to an environment where you cannot be overtly armed, where you're truly concealed, not covered, you're not having your gun covered, but true concealment or undetectable levels of firearms. And the most likely thing where you would ever have to use a firearm would be in a street robbery or assault. So, we tried to apply this to where outside of the home where you, where folks are the situation most people will be in when they need these skills. And that, so the whole class is sort of geared to that where 
you know, Cecil's handing the hand to hand and the maneuvering and the setting yourself up for success on dealing with people as they approach you on the street, whether it's for a robbery, an attack, an assault. Uh, for the women, you can add the sexual assault side of that, a lot of that, to all the way up to if this goes extremely bad it, with a lethal force option at the end. And then we use Chuck to sort of tie that into the middle of kind of gluing <laughs> the approach and the force up with the firearms side, and he kind of integ- helps glue me and Cecil together, if that makes sense. Oh yeah, that that's that's a lot better way to put it than I was trying to. That's that, okay. That's wonderful. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, so to to kind of be clear too, that the way I saw it is that, and and like you mentioned also is that this, especially when when there's gun and invo- guns involved in a class, you know, this it was not a typical shooting class. The, to me, a good nutshell was half of this was learning about your methods of remaining undetected with 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 weapons or um, force options on one hand. And you guys all taught amazing information on that, including a a presentation of of what you guys um, carry often. I mean, from from hardly anything to the firearms, but then the other half, and and that's where you really came in, um, Daryl, is the decision making process, especially when it comes to employing a shot fired. So, I think that leads us into where I'd like to go into what you your acronym, which is C. And, and how that goes into, you know, how you evaluate threats. If you could explain that. It was a great sure. lecture. And, and I didn't invent C. I, I stole that from a guy named Eugene Zink, who was a former Delta Force operator. Way back in the early 90s, I took a class from him. And I didn't take a lot because the firearm side of what they were doing was not compatible with our law enforcement side. But the threat processing was. And then... <laughs> You know, fast forward 20 something odd years and we've, I've played with it for 20 years, but I like the simplicity of it. So we go through a process of where we see or use our senses to pick up threats. Then we need to evaluate those threats. And, you know, I went in depth in the lecture on what those threats look like and what we're looking for. Then we evaluate those threats based on everything from legality, time of day, uh, is the situation uh, disparity of force where you have somebody bigger and somebody smaller, uh, disparity of skill, disparity of weapons, whatever it is, but we have an evaluation process and that process changes from where you are or what you're doing. And I use the example, for example, that the amount of threat evaluation you need to use in your home at three o'clock in the morning when a door gets kicked in is not a ton of an evaluation process needed there. You need some, but not a ton and it's not very complicated. But as soon as you leave your home and you're walking around in public or in somebody else's business or private property with a firearm or with a weapon, and then you're dealing with something there, the, the evaluation process gets to the point that it is almost as much as what a metropolitan police officer has to go through these days. And then again, you know, you compare that to people who've worked in a military environment where the only evaluation may may be, uh, the people over there, the bad are, are good to go, which is not a high level of evaluation. Well, you counter that up with, say there's, um, you know, everybody loves doing the active shooter stuff. And I'm like, okay, I was just in one of these events. And because of where I was and the proximity to it, what do you do when you're trying to pick that bad guy out out of thousands of stampeding good people? How much threat evaluation do I have to do and how fast do I need to do it? And it's extremely complicated. Um, If you were in the middle of church, if you were, 
uh, in a parking lot or walking into a store in the middle of an encounter, how much evaluation do you need to do? And it's actually pretty extensive and complicated. Then we get into the uh, elimination of those threats after the evaluation, which can be anything from, a, um, like we say, a professional display of weapons. It could be a simple command presence, a verbal challenge, all the way up to employment of a firearm and then actually discharge of that firearm at the final end of that. And it's an extensive process. And what we did is we kind of forced you guys to go through that every time you press the trigger on a gun this weekend. And yes, that's really hard. Um, and like I tell people, the reality is you have to do that process in the United States for constitutional and legal employment of lethal force, you have to go through that process every single time you press a trigger. You have to go through that process probably multiple times before you can even deploy a firearm. And it is an extensive and complex process. Now, there's people out there you had, um, you know, particularly in the case of myself and Chuck, you got a couple guys teaching this who've done this thousands upon, you know, tens of thousands of times for real. As a job, it's just the nature of the thing. We're it, we're we're very comfortable at it, but we still realize it's still complicated and easy to make mistakes. But you're trying to teach people how to do this, who in most cases, most normal folks have never had to do this before, at a at a high level or under an extreme amount of stress. So what we tried to do is give you all the tools you need and some practical ways to apply this before you just start shooting. And we tell people this is not a shooting class. It is a uh, legal application of lethal force class with, mm -hmm. with the firearm side. It's actually just a legal application of force from start to finish. But the finish with the firearms is we're teaching you to apply uh, moral, legal, and ethical constitutional use of force with a firearm as opposed to being a shooting class. Mm -hmm. Instead of, yeah, definitely not a, like a normal class where you're, where you're going there and you're getting coached on technique, et cetera. I, frankly, I don't recall any touch on technique because I mean, most of the shooters were already um, decently prepared for, the the actual shooting technique that was required for the class just some quick admin stuff now october 28th i'll be teaching our evolution security defensive pistol one class here in the tulsa area go ahead and go to the show notes where we have the event bright link for that class and come and train with us it's going to be a a blast a great concealed carry focused class and we want to implore you as listeners to go out to iTunes and rate and review our show. And then, of course, share the show to your friends and tell them they can listen to it anywhere there are podcasts you can get, get our show. So we really appreciate the help in getting the show out there. Like you were saying, it's all about the decision making process. And especially you know, since we're going to, since we have you on, we're going to focus mainly on the, the firearms portion, but you had, you implemented after you kind of put us through, you know, some, not really, you put us kind of through an evaluation of our shooting skills to make sure that there wasn't any um, remedial, um, you know, issues that you needed to address before we could go forward with the more complicated drills. But then, yeah. So that first, uh, that first exercise you did was really for me to evaluate if you have the skills necessary to make a truly acceptable shot on a human being. And kind of, as I talked about in class, uh, it, it, uh, you would never take anybody hunting who could not make a, a heart lung shot on an animal by the same token. We don't want you running around with a firearm. If you can't ethically have the skills to basically ethically shoot another human being. 
So, which is going to require that upper thoracic, um, I'm sorry, upper aor aortic arch in the upper thoracic area or into the head. And basically, you need to be able to hit a large orange or a small grapefruit on demand. And so we made sure everybody was at least capable of that to the distances we would be using in class, which weren't horrifically far because the reality of being robbed or assaulted on the street is they've got to be close enough to rob or assault you. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> you know, guys trying to give me your money who are 25 yards away. <laughs> um, you know, that's, uh, I'd go full Nike on that and I'm pretty slow. <laughs> and still, that would be a better option. I've seen how most people shoot at 25 yards. Um, you know, you got some better options. So most of these engagements occur actually well within the five-yard range. So that's where we spent most of our time. But I still need to be able to, 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 you know, to basically hit this or this. And, you know, that's why we start off on the uh, B8 bulls is because that center black doesn't lie about what that is. And you notice we place those on the targets in the correct place where they need to be shot. So, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, so then after that, you, it, it, I can't recall if it was maybe, I believe it was a total of three different drills, but they, you had drills that you had us making decisions based on input that was, Semi, I, I'd love for you to explain it better than me, but at the, <laughs> at the same time, so that it you set up multiple and gradually increasing in um, complexity and stress, by the way, um, drills for us to practice making decisions with a lethal, actual lethal right, firearm so, in our hand. Mm -hmm. So the next thing we moved into was uh, what we call the hits El Presidente. So the the goal of that now that you've been through it i can kind of explain what you were doing and it'll make a little more sense than you were going cold into it was um what we incorporate doing that is the targets aren't moving and there's no um there's no uh real decision making on the target they all i i did all the work for you they all get mm -hmm. two you know they all get two in the center chest there was no real work on the targets what I did to you, though, is I did something that nobody's probably ever done before, is I cover the range in no cover targets in front of these, and then you have uh, backstop issues with no cover targets behind the shoot targets, and most people have never dealt with that before. And, you know, we started with how I do range commands, which not every not every command is a shoot command. Sometimes yeah. you've... You can't even pull a firearm or you got to draw to a ready or you got to leave it at ready and verbally challenge. I mean, all of the things that most people are using for shoot commands with us weren't. Correct, you know, yeah. So we started off even just starting off as kind of gearing you guys that, you know, you just don't get to paint everything with a firearm every time because you feel like it. And I try to... <laughs> We try to uh, truly bury the concept in your head. Everybody likes to look at this from the position of being the shooter. And I'm trying to make you guys look at this as what if that was you and your family intermixed down there of how would you want a shooter to respond to that with you downrange? And it changes the complexity of things like, again, you know, anybody want to raise their hand who you'll let in this room cover your children with a firearm? Uh, we didn't have any hands go up. Yet we go out in the real world and we run muzzles over no shoots and training classes all the time. Mm -hmm. And so we change the concept. They're not no shoots, they're no covers. So all of our targets are no cover targets. It, you know, they're you know, when we sit there and we talk about rule two of the firearms rules, and we're, as you know, <laughs> we're pretty deep on that. Yes, sir. Um when we when we go to rule two, never let your muzzle cover anything you're not willing to kill or destroy. Uh, that, that encompasses a lot with a cover. It's not point, it's flat out cover. So once I make the targets like for real in which they're all no cover targets, well, that changes the complexity of things. 
So you end up with um, a situation where most people aren't used to doing that. That those, they just call them no-shoots. They're not no-shoots. They're no covers. And then we turn all of the other targets, the bad guys, are all then no-shoot, shoot, no shoots, are the bad guys. And it's a little different philosophy than anybody else is doing. And it makes you be careful, and it showed a lot of people how many bad habits you have. Uh, well, for putting muzzles on things that don't need muzzles on them, and fingers on triggers when they don't need fingers on triggers. And it gets to be... It, it's hard. So we use that second exercise to really anchor that these are things you don't point guns at. And there's others and, and that every round you fire hits something. So if you miss or it goes through, it's going to hit something in the back. And then we start putting no covers back there and it becomes a whole new exercise. Well, I, I can say this, you know, I'm, I'm definitely, you know, with this show, it, Long before this show, I was a, a training junkie, and you know, I've I've got some decent pistol skills, and and I've I've um, shot a lot of competition and all that stuff. You know, we, but at the same time, this was the first time I really ever had to to surgically insert my pistol where I was not covering anything else, either behind the target. Or um, or in front of it sideways again, l- like you said, if and there were a couple of people that were kind of conditioned in in say like IDPA where there's no shoots and they were you know flagging every every target and what's great they were learning from that not not putting them down or anything, but it was in in your drills. I'm used to, um, you know, moving pretty quick, but boy, I had to slow down. I did not want to make a mistake. And well, you've probably never been forced to think that much with a gun in your hand. Yeah. And it's hard. Oh yeah. And you know, again, we always go to, you know, the people who have the hardest time with the shooting in this class tend to be the best shooters. Yeah. (laughs) If that makes sense, because oh, yeah. the ones, especially the ones who have deepened to competitive shooting, mm-hmm. because, you know, everybody goes out and reads the safety rules and then they proceed to throw a bunch of no shoot targets up and everybody runs muzzles over them. Yeah. And they're, and it's, it's conditioned to a subconscious level that those don't matter and they do matter when they're real people. And then everybody says, well, if it was for real, I wouldn't done that. Well, No, you've never trained to not do it. And as a matter of fact, you're at a subconsciously conditioned to do it. And your practice has now made these things permanent. The people who get through this class the easiest tend to have some decent fundamental shooting skills and no formal and haven't taken a bunch of shooting classes or or shooting competition. They tend to, they tend to excel at this more than everybody because they're, they don't have any bad habits. Yeah. Yeah. And, but you harking back to what you said a little bit ago. So we, we progressed through these, these drills and the more complex they got, let's just say there were by the end, um, we had a handful of variables to consider, but again, and, when you're when you're forced even to like and yet forgive me daryl the the position that we were working in where we were pointing straight down i did not write down what you called that so can you just say that again it, it, we, we we call it we call it indoor ready with a pistol indoor and that ready. comes from mod ready uh the nra calls it the uh teaches it as the safety circle um we kind of incorporated took the kind of body positioning off that, that the way the NRA law enforcement program teaches a safety circle. And what I did is I incorporated that into modern technique terminology and use as indoor ready with a pistol. And, and all it is, is I, I'm not a big fan of Sewell. I just see mm-hmm. too many muzzles getting violated in traditional Sewell. So this is just extended into a ready. We break the wrist and the gun goes straight down. Now we don't run around like that. 
as I told you in class, it's we use it to deal with children, fellow team members or family members, and obvious non-combatants. Now, if you can tell me any reason that those need a muzzle on them, I'm open to it. Mm. But I would venture there isn't a court in the land that will agree with you that that's okay, and certainly not in you know a uh, uh, criminal statute. You know the you know I tell people I go, can you think of a reason you need to put a muzzle on a six year old? You know if you don't have some freakish anomaly of the fantasy, well, they're wearing a suicide vest, mm-hmm. you know, and even then you still got a pretty bad situation. You still got a difficult situation, mm-hmm. but in most cases, children, and I'm not talking teen gang members with guns. I'm talking children should never have a muzzle placed on them. You wouldn't want it on your kids. I don't want it on my kids. And it, 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 it's a, it's a kind of a no go. And Anybody who advocates that that's okay because they're so skilled, I, 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 go, go you do you, but that ain't going to fly. Mm-hmm. That may fly somewhere in your fantasy land, um, but I, I've been on both, as I told you guys, I've been on both sides of the table uh, for post-shooting stuff. Mm-hmm. You let me know how it goes if that goes bad. Yeah, as where your what section of the penal code justifies a felony assault with a firearm on a child that you can articulate that in any way, shape, or form that that's acceptable. You know, other than, well, I, I shoot a lot and I'm faster going to transit. You know, I mean, it's all utter garbage. So other family members or teammates, when obviously we're teaching law enforcement or, or some type of folks who work in a team, you know, you don't cover your teammates. I don't care how good you think you are. You don't cover your teammates. By the same token, you, you, there's no reason to cover your own family members who, who are with you or friends or whatever. And then obvious non-combatants. You know, there's a lot of people floating around the world who are obviously not the bad guys. Um, and they don't need muzzles pointed on them either just because they're standing near a bad guy or wandered into a gas station at the wrong time just like you did. Um those things do not, there's no exemption in the penal code for felony feloniously assaulting those people with a firearm. So we're conditioning you to not do it. And I think if you watched me demo this stuff, I have no problem moving a muzzle off something in split seconds from on to off, Mm -hmm. you know, where I'm not doing that, but I train myself different than most people do. If that makes sense. Oh yeah. You know, well, I, most people are most people are working like transition speeds on shoots. I'm doing those same exercises of working transition speed from a shoot to another shoot with three no covers between them. That's a mm-hmm. different that's a different technique for that transition. And then I've got to do a C evaluation on one transition with through all those no covers. Do another C evaluation on that before I put a gun on it. And then I've also got a rule four clear that for backstops. Yeah, there's a lot going on. Oh, yeah. And sadly, we just make this about pressing triggers as fast as humanly possible. And that's fun. Um, you know, that's things we can put a timer on and give you an award when it's over or a rating or something. And, you know, that's great. It's just not what I do anymore. Mm-hmm. There was a time I did all that stuff. There was a time I was shooting competition and doing all these things. And I found myself picking up a lot of bad habits. And as we told you guys in class, Chuck and I became friends probably about 25 years ago. Him and I both got on a pretty hard crusade to get cops to stop pointing guns at things that don't need guns pointed at them. And we've simply in our, you know, simply extended that to outside of our law enforcement training stuff. Uh, to just extend that to that applies to everybody is just quit pointing guns at things that don't need guns pointed at them. Well, uh, I'll, I'll say this too. And, and I, I want to say something about Chuck here in a second after we get through this little bit, but, but I did want to say this. So we finally, I'm going to tie this in, but we finally, after another um, decision exercise, 
um, we finally, at the end of day three, we basically had a final exam that pulled all these things that you worked with us on into a significantly more complicated, random and unknown to us, um, you know, scenario that we had to really use um, the acronym and, and process of um, eliminating threats, deciding what to do to eliminate them, going through that process multiple times when we're just turning around. It wasn't a, it wasn't a stage in a, um, you know, even a complicated stage in a competition. It was more complicated than that because you're turning around, you've got pressure, everybody around you. <laughs> but it was, it was, it definitely was probably some of the slowest shooting I've done. But, and the interesting thing is, I didn't think about my shooting whatsoever because I couldn't think about my shooting, really. I had to think about all the other things to, quote, pass the exam um, or, or final exercise that, that there was no way to think about shooting. And, and well, I, what was funny is you did some of your best shooting like a couple people in class when you couldn't tell me anything about the shooting because you were shooting at a subconscious level. The couple ones where you were just stacking rounds into the same hole tended to be the ones where you were so taxed on even the decision to press the trigger that the shooting went subconscious. And I'll give you the key. That's where you want to be. Yes, I mean, sir. that's truly where you want to be, that the shooting part is subconscious. You have obviously trained enough that your mechanical shoot, you know, technical shooting skills are at a level that you shoot just fine at five yards mm -hmm. to handle any of these problems. The problem comes in is, is you've not spent nearly the time. And should I even be pressing the trigger? Mm -hmm. You know, if I gave you that stage again, you know, the scenario I gave you at the end, was it horribly unrealistic? No. Or was it a pretty realistic scenario? Oh yeah. That could happen to anybody. You know, oh, yeah. it very, wasn't very some realistic. outlandish, yeah, we had no, uh, you know, you know, Hamas paragliders. We did not have any ISIS, Al Qaeda, fifth dismounted Hell's Angels. We didn't have any of that. It was a very basic thing that could happen to anybody going to a gas station, you know, busy gas station. Yes, and the uh, is the scenario you got, and we changed those scenarios for every class. They're yeah. all tend to be the same situational thing, but the actual what's going on changes. Sure. Now, let me, let me undo that and say, if you were at a shooting match, say that was an IDPA match or mm -hmm. USBSA or something. And the bad guy targets were just bad guy targets and everything else was what it was. Was that, was that a stage you would find in any shooting match? No. Um, well, okay. no, no, I mean, no, no. If, if if you could run the muzzles on all oh, the no shoots, yes, if you didn't yes. have to make a show, no shoot on the on the bad guys, if you didn't have to decide how many rounds the bad guy needed or not, if all of the uh, stuff I did with the other stimuli you needed before you could press a trigger, cover, try, if none of that was there, would that have been a pretty good stage for a match? Uh, oh, certainly, certainly. Yeah, that you would have done in six seconds. <laughs> you yeah, know, it, it's, it would. <laughs> It's exactly what I was thinking that, yeah, that, that was a, that was, would have been, you know, kind of a burn through stage. You would have burned that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That wasn't complicated on the shoots, but what was complicated was all the other crap going on. You know, it's like, oh, wait, I gotta, I gotta put an evaluation kind of on the whole scene. And then I got to compress this down to these individual targets and then should I even shoot that? And then what, how many times should I shoot it? Mm -hmm. And Oh God, there's something standing behind it. So I got to take four steps over to clear a shooting lane for it. You know, there's, it all of a sudden got a little complicated. Oh boy. I, I, I remember <laughs> when, when you gave me the command to go, I moved over to see what the scenario was. And at first I can't remember exactly what I said. I started walking around there real slow. Okay. I think I even said something like, man, I'm screwed. 
Because <laughs> when I first saw it, I thought, okay, I'm confused in the instructions. I was confused in the instructions real quick. I started questioning it in my mind. And then when I finally figured it out, I started shooting. But man, I, again, I, I don't know how slow I did you that. Literally had to, you literally kind of had to walk around and, and take kind of a gander at everything before you even kind of like, okay, now I, I, I can start shooting. I really, it took you a long time to sort of take the whole thing in. And the reality was there were nine things down there. Yeah. Which in the big picture is not a lot. If you yeah. think about go to a gas station or Seven Eleven or wherever Walmart parking lot, go into a grocery store, whatever, nine, nine things. It's not a lot of stuff in the real world of what, yeah you know, is out there in urban America, you know, nine things in deep rural somewhere might be a big deal, but you know, God, I wouldn't even, and you know, we had to call it something else. Cause if it was Bucky's, it'd be 900, <laughs> yeah. you know, <laughs> you know, things. And, and uh, half of them so, will be buying beef jerky. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> so you, you end up with, this isn't a real complicated thing, but, in the real world, that's really complicated stuff if you're doing it right. And mm -hmm. most people are sort of programmed. You actually did the right thing is you didn't even pull a gun out till you had kind of an idea like what was going on. And you picked that up obviously from a lesson earlier in the class that mm -hmm. don't don't even don't even skin that smoke wagon until you know what you got. Because mm -hmm. how many people did we have pulling guns on a complete no gun scenario, mm -hmm. but you're just so used to, well, it's shooting class. Of course, I'm going to take a gun out, you know, and it's like, yeah, not every time. And, you know, and again, most of the training focuses everything on speed, speed, speed. F how fast is your draw? How fast are your splits? How fast your transition? How fast, how fast, how fast? Not how fast can you process the problem mm -hmm. before you even go to the gun? Once you go to the gun, how fast can you process the evaluation process? And you've got to do it every single shot. Mm -hmm. And we're doing very little training or setting performance parameters around that. And, you know, we're, but we're the entire social media and training community obsesses about 1% of what the real world part of the equation is. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And, and then that's where you and, and I've even had to I mean, I love to shoot, but the fact is that it comes down to it. You got to really understand a lot of that is a hobby. Um, it, it, yes. it, that's what it comes down to is, you know, all of us that have let's just say have a modicum of of our feet in the water in this national training community. We have way more shooting skills than we would ever need. Um, so, in other words, that's when at some point it turns over into a hobby and you're doing a, like you said, often you're doing a kata. Um, is there anything yeah. wrong with the kata? No. There's a lot that goes into that kata, but we need to get down to to when the bare minimum, when the, when the pads come on and, and you start sparring just as an analogy, but to, to summarize it, unless you had one more point there, I don't want to interrupt you, um, Daryl, but to, to me, let, let me add, cause you just actually said something really brilliant. Uh, so I'm going to let you, I'm going I'm okay. to acknowledge your brilliance right now. All right. It, there's nothing wrong with having a shooting hobby. You know what I mean? It's like, it's a, it's a hobby that, has some practical return to it for self-defense. There's mm -hmm. nothing wrong with shooting as a hobby, shooting competitively, just like, you know, Brazilian jiu-jitsu. There's nothing wrong with having a martial arts based thing, hobby mm -hmm. or sport or whatever that is relative to what you're doing. Even if you were, your hobby was, running or going to the gym or doing whatever, all of those are really great things 
to supplement or can assist you if you're ever fighting for your life. Your oh. your hobby actually has some practical application. Yeah. And then for some people, they're deep dived into hobbies. For other people, uh, this world tends to be a magnet for neurotic people. That you know, if I get this flashlight, I can I won't be scared of the dark. And if I get the better's flashlight, I'll be my, you know they obsess, mm -hmm. absolutely obsess about the gear. You know, mm -hmm. how much did your gear matter? Oh, not not in the least. And <laughs> and it was my I was running my my Glock forty two, which frankly I I carry quite a bit, but I don't shoot a lot. The good thing is that gun. It's quite easy to shoot for a smaller gun. It's not super small, but it's fairly easy to Absolutely. shoot. Absolutely. But no, that is a very realistic size gun for what we're do we were doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And did you did the, did 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 your your choice of firearm hold you back? Oh, was not that at all. what was really holding it? Was that what was really holding you back? Oh, or no. was it your brain brain processing that was holding you back? 100% brain. And, and I'll even add, I, I thought about this earlier. Daryl, do you know that in in every single one of the drills past the, um, the assessment, the first assessment, I do not recall seeing my dot one time. Right. I obviously had to have. It obviously had to have been. Some of them. You had a couple. You had a couple of shots. You must have seen your dot because you you had a couple of them that you were sinking rounds right, literally in the same hole. When I was watching them, and because I was kind of laughing because I'm like, eh, he had no dot on that one. Had no. Oh, there's the dot. <laughs> you know. Oh, he had the dot for both shots on that one. You know. And you know, again, it sort of all became. The gear became irrelevant oh, because yeah. you were so overtaxed with thinking that, it, it, you know, and I, I, I sort of tell people, I go, like, would you be better off if your, your only goal is I want to get home to my family without getting, being, being prey or victim or mm -hmm. horribly injured or killed on a street robbery, you know, all of a sudden, but I go to work in an environment or I'm in a place where I really can't carry yeah, you know, no matter what everybody says that you can, you know, that you can conceal your USPSA open optics gun. Okay, you know, let me know. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, when we start getting into, I just picked this up today. Yeah, you know, oh, this yeah. is going to be my new, my new sort of travel NPE because I was looking hard at the forty twos. It's a, it's a bear slide three sixty five ten round mag. Vanguard. I mean, this is is pretty pretty minimalist stuff. You, you said, you know, that'll solve three sixty five. Okay, and and it looks like does it have a bore sight grip job on it? Yeah, yeah. I I have such horrific arthritis that my grip strength is horribly uh, degraded. Mm -hmm. And I what's kind of nice is the way Ben does these for me. Um, they're textured pretty hard and it's almost like I'm holding a ball mm -hmm. and it allows me to run these little guns. Cause normally like a Glock 43, I can't run to save my life. Cause you got to mm. death grip the things, Yeah, but which I don't snappy. have a death grip anymore. And, and he did, I was working a job where that was like, I, I had, to, I had to have a truly deep, undetectable firearm ben built mm -hmm. me a custom 40 so 48 slide on a 43 frame with his job the, the way he did the the grip and everything and the gun was spectacular for that that's still a fairly difficult gun for me to shoot mm -hmm. this thing these things the 365 with his grip frame works for me i don't do a thing to the guns other than put it in one of his grip frames and I, and he, you know, I talked about, I run a lot of the 10 round guns cause I travel so much mm -hmm. that I don't even have to think about it. I take 10 round magazines. They don't tip out over my belt line at all. And they're just, uh, I don't have to think about them much, but I can actually shoot these real well or certainly within the level I need to shoot them at, you know? Yeah. Well, it's just funny. So you can, this is my, <laughs> whenever I can make it work. Which is actually, I can wear fairly loose clothing most of the time. But yeah, here's my um, 19 that Ben did for me. Right. And they're just, you know, they're, and, and you know, that's almost for me like, you know, I, I, 
One of my big favorites is the uh, PX4 compact that Langdon does, which essentially my PX4s look like that now. They got a, a dot on them on a on a PX4. Absolutely love the things. Uh, other than this one, all my 365s have dots on them too. Mm. Um, you know, my eyes are get my eyes are getting aged. I've really devoted myself to learning how to shoot these. But the reality is, I can make this gun a lot smaller without the dot for what this one is intended for. And, you know, you, 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 everybody wants to get wrapped up around the gear. You know, we didn't have anybody have a, any problem handling this class from red dot sighted, fairly, you know, good gun, you know, bigger guns with dots and all that right down to, you know, the 22 revolvers. Mm -hmm. Nobody was particularly handicapped by their choice of gun they were handicapped by their ability to process. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I want to put a fine point on that, Daryl, is that, um, you're a, you're a pretty tough dude, been through a lot and, and you're no nonsense, but here, here's something that was really cool. Hopefully I'm not giving away too much here. And, and, but w what I mean is, you put the pressure on us through the tasks that you were, um, having us take care of while shooting, but you also were very, very encouraging in between the shots, uh, in between the scenarios. So, I, I mean, I appreciated that a lot. Um, you know, there, there's some instructors that are great that actually do exactly what you did, put pressure on with the, with the, um, the skills that you're working on, but then also putting the pressure on yelling in your ear sometimes. You might be able to guess someone I'm talking about, but, <laughs> but yeah. no, you, you, well, were... you know, you, you know, honestly, some students need that. Um, most of them don't. And especially this was new to everybody. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, here's the thing I I've been teaching now professionally going on 35 years. And a lot of it was inside of an agency or within law enforcement, you know, most of my students didn't even want to be there. Yeah. If that makes sense. They're oh, yeah. doing, you know, I was lucky that uh, the, literally kind of the first part of my instructional career, um, all of my, my students were SWAT cops and those just let people know those aren't magical. It just means they, they tend to be in a little bit better physical shape. Um, just being on SWAT doesn't mean they have any better weapons and firearm stuff than anybody else. They just tend to get more sustained training that really helps. Mm -hmm. Um, and I had great mentors in that, you know, I cut my teeth with the legends of LAPD D platoon with, you know, Larry Mudgett and Scott Reitz and John Helms and Ralph Morton and those guys. That's who I cut my teeth with. That's who start, started with as my early things. I've had guys like Bill jeans, Pat Rod. I've had some of the bet Tom Givens, Ken Hackathorn, some of the best, Gen one instructors out there and mentors. And there's a lot more to this, to teaching than yelling at people and setting some range standard of whatever it is that you got to do. Um, you know, I, I, you know, some people you can push again. I told you, I've had people on some of my high accountability stuff where I put children's faces on those no cover targets mm -hmm. And the backstops, I've had students crying. Yeah. Because they never, I've had students come, come, I recently had a student come up to me after this particular class and tell me, and, he, and you know, it's not like he had a per, bad performance or anything, but said, right now I'm really evaluating whether I should be carrying a gun in public. Mm-hmm. You know, certainly no doubt on the home defense and home protection, but he said, you know, I have, and you know, it's one of those guys taking a lot of classes, very, very serious about this. And he said, you know, I, I did not realize how much potential there is for this to go horribly wrong on a very minor mistake. And you showed me how easy it is to go wrong on a simple not looking at the right thing or getting my processing out of order. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot that can go wrong out there. And most people are trained by television and social media that this is 
easy. Mm. It's not easy. It's not, you know, it is not easy. And with tasks like this, it's imperative um, with our instructor cadre that we use with this class that these are some of the best folks you'll have out there. Not just me. I mean, with Chuck and Cecil as well. Oh, yeah. That will mentor and, and hold your hand and guide you through this process without making you feel like crap about it for not being good at it. Cause you've never done it before. Yeah. Is the reality you've done the skills. Like you could get a high level BJJ guy in there in one of Cecil classes and they might fail when they've got to start applying that as a force matrix, not as a, yeah, you could got all these submission techniques, but you shouldn't even have hands on anybody right now. Mm-hmm. So that becomes, that becomes critical. You know, we always worry about, you know, the uh, industry parrots and charlatans out there trying to copy this class. And what we tell people is you'll never, you'll never copy the, the experience level or the instructional depth on this. You can try to steal our curriculum, but minus how we coach it, you know, you ain't going to be, you're, you aren't going to be able to do it. It's a unique, it's a truly unique thing. Well, I, I can tell you the most beyond being placed in a unfamiliar and actually something, you know, many things that none of us have really ever done before. Shy of that, the, the most important aspect of this class was, like I said earlier, I said, I wish I had my phone recording all the wisdom bombs dropping from all three of you because the the experience that you guys all have had and each time you gave a talk or we can call it lecture just to keep it simple you you backed it all up with multiple experiences maybe to back up the same concept and there's no way like you said that there's especially all three of you that it would be really really hard to get someone that yes could could take your material, you know, the same kind of concepts, but give it the coaching, like you said, coaching from a stance of actual experience. And it was, of course, extremely apparent. I had, I've taken classes, Cecil's a pretty good friend of mine. I've taken a few classes of his and very, you know, quite familiar with what he teaches, but you can always go through that a million times because it's so dang hard. And I've, I've worked with Chuck and talked to Chuck quite a few times, but I, this, this weekend I had heard you on some podcasts and which were really intriguing to me actually. And we can go on to part of that here in a minute. But the fact was that I had never heard you speak much more than about 30 minutes on a podcast, but listening to you this weekend, it was extremely apparent your experience and, and that you didn't teach things without having the experience to, excuse me, without it having experience backing it up. Okay. So when Wayne Dobbs and I started hardwired tactical, you know, one of the core things we did and we don't teach theory based instruction, all of ours, you know, a lot of people throw the word reality training or reality based, you know, the, most of those came from somebody else's reality or I heard, or I saw a video or I watched, you know, I mean, it's, it's not firsthand. So Mm -hmm. the reality is that true knowledge comes from beating this stuff out on an anvil of experience Mm -hmm. and from experience. So experience comes from failures and wisdom comes from experience. So when you say we were kind of, and when we do, we sort of carpet bomb the class with wisdom. Mm-hmm. All of that wisdom came from our personal failures. Yeah. Every bit of it are off of personal failures. Mm-hmm. And whether it was our personal failure or like with Chuck and I, that personal failure that we were the investigators on where it was firsthand mm-hmm. and in depth with what the failure looked like. Um, and in Cecil's case, you know, we love kind of working with Cecil because he truly brings the civilian side into it or the citizen, you know, the non-sworn, non-mill, non-cop side of it. 
Mm -hmm. But, you know, most people don't realize what Cecil's depth in the martial arts community looks like. Yeah. And we, him and I laugh because, you know, we, we've, we've been through some, a lot of the same little pathways. He was deeper on the martial arts side and I was deeper on the firearms side. Yeah. But we laugh about all this stuff that goes back, you know, 30, 35, 40 years of the combatives development and how many failures we've had, you know, for as good as Cecil is in BJJ, Go have an in-depth conversation with them about the losses to get there. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> yeah, gee, did you set a record for like the fastest guy ever submitted? Where you were the dude getting submitted, you know, and it becomes, that becomes a driving thing of that'll never happen again. Mm -hmm. You know, because you made a mistake that got you, that bought you an L, you know, yeah, or got you hurt. And in my case, and I know in Chuck's case, I mean, a lot of our cases are stuff that got us hurt uh -huh. or, or, or we were unable, unlike a lot of the law enforcement stuff, um, you know, there's a saying that came out of, uh, LA, LA Sheriff's department, SEB of, you know, a lot of times fortuitous outcomes, you know, dictates bad cat, you know, the people basically got lucky. Mm-hmm. And then we base all of our tactics on stuff that was luck or we pat everybody on the back and it was great, you know, hoorah. And not all of us operate on that. Most of us, if we were properly mentored and trained, is all the learning came from failing, mm -hmm. you know. But you got to get out and actually do it to fail at it. And, you know, that was part of I told all of you guys at the beginning of the weekend. What I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to give you one one brutal failure after another all weekend, mm -hmm. not 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 through trickery, yeah, of simply exposing you to something you've never done before under stress, and I'm going to give you those failures with no consequences. You know, we all had to learn that of those failures with consequences. Yeah, you know, in in our world, a bad shooting, a bad use of force, a bad decision get you killed. You know, not reading something right, get you hurt. And I, I mean, I, I have a, you know, I'm 100% disabled. That's how I went out of the police department for making mistakes. You know, I got myself hurt pretty bad over multiple times. Mm. You know, when I did the whole thing on, you know, the value of a crescent wrench as a weapon, because I had one punch through my eye, I know. Yeah. It will knock you stone cold out. And so that doesn't, those things come with pain, with blood, with training time, with, you know, in Cecil's case, a lot of mat time, you know, and, and mine and Chuck's is from a lot of street time. And you just sit there and go, how can we package this to handle, hand these students this type of experience, but without them having to pay heavy consequences. And that's really what the class is, is, is building your experience but you through failures, you know, mm -hmm. or watching other people fail firsthand. I mean, you're like standing there going, Oh no, I know what that dude just did, you know, mm -hmm. or, Oh, Oh no, 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 no. Don't take the shot. Don't. I mean, how many of the scenarios were you looking at the target going, don't take that shot. Don't in your head. Mm -hmm. And then watching them put rounds into it and you go, Oh God, you know, <laughs> or, or don't, don't, don't shoot. Now there's a target, right? There's a no sh cover right behind it, you know? And then watching them take the shots. And so you learn not only from your failures, you got to learn from watching other people's failures. And nobody went to jail at the end, and nobody mm -hmm. should be losing sleep over a lifetime trauma from making a, a mistake that hurts somebody you shouldn't. Well, some, some insight into that very thing. I was texting back and forth with a friend of mine that we're, we're, you know, talking about meeting for dinner next weekend. And I said, well, I'm, I'm about to head out of town. I've got a really cool class um, with, with, you know, I gave her all the name or, you know, just some individuals and, and said, you know, this is going to be a really difficult class. It's, there's going to be lots of decision making. It's not just, a, I mean, I said it, it's not a normal shooting class. I said, and you know, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to fail in front of a bunch of people. <laughs> and 
you know, in a summary there, kind of roundabout way. <laughs> but and then she sent back a text saying, that, I'll be honest, that does not sound like fun at all. And I shot back, you know what? It actually is fun because when you, and I just said that, the exact same thing. When you fail, you learn. That's, it's the most valuable way to learn is to fail. And especially in a class where there aren't consequences, like you said. So, yeah, but you know, it's, it's, it's that we try to make that class a little bit fun, you know, mm. with the lectures and sort of going through stuff, but the, the, with the consequences, we also give you accomplishments Yes, and they usually come back to back. You know, when I give you those commands and somebody pointed a gun at something they're sub not supposed to, and then the next, and then from then on, you never do it again in class. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a major accomplishment that should bring joy to your heart that, you know, mm -hmm. I just broke a habit or I just instantly corrected this from making a mistake to not making that mistake the rest of the class, mm -hmm. you know, which, which should translate into you're so consciously aware of it because of the failure and being embarrassed in front of everybody. And, you know, the ones where I would give like a, uh, a no shoot threat command and then somebody blow, you know, bang on that target, you know, they shoot mm -hmm. the target. I think one of those was you, if I remember right, you know, and, uh, I don't, think it was so, either you maybe. or the, maybe it was a guy, maybe it was a guy next to you, but somebody did it. I remember on your side where you weren't supposed to shoot and they shot and, you know, you got that experience of God, I, I'm glad that wasn't me or I, you know, but then you get to feel accomplished that you you've now had a bad experience that doesn't get repeated. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's fantastic. You know, that yeah. that's, that's where all the happiness and joy is. I mean, we can create a class where everybody feels good about themselves through yeah. the whole class. It'd be fun. You know, it'll be a lot of fun. We're just going to have a fun shooting class where we encourage you to just be happy. And it doesn't matter what you do. We're going to say nice things about you. You know, that's, that's yeah, like, it, you know, that's like, that, that's, a, that's getting the, everybody gets an award pizza party and that's kind of not our thing. Well, and then how many people are actually going to remember that class two years down the road, right? And, unless the only thing they're after is, is, you know, dopamine from, from feeling good that the people that really want to learn, right? It, it, the difficult things. Okay. So like, for instance, um, just real quick, our audience has heard this story a few times probably, but my first ECQC, um, extreme close quarters concepts class from Craig Douglas, I was so scared right before the first evolution, you know, the, <laughs> the, the, the matchup, right? People understand it as fight club. I was going to quit. And, but then right when they put that fist helmet on me, all of a sudden I wanted to overcome it. And then once I got through it and, and frankly got my butt handed to me, I, I, I was elated. And at, by the end of that class, I, I was hooked on that kind of training where it's difficult. You make mistakes. You, um, you really don't like it in the middle of it necessarily. But at the end of the day, at the end of the weekend, it's some of the best time you've ever had. And and you didn't, and you didn't die. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Your mistake didn't cost you a trip to the hospital. Your mistake didn't cost you a lifetime injury, disability, whatever. But you, you now have answer. You've now been as close as you can to being in a real situation like that. Mm -hmm. But again, without the consequences of that, you know, yes, if that makes yes. sense. And the other oh, thing, a lot of that stuff, um, how's your gear selection look after that stuff? Oh, you're talking about like after ECQC? Yeah. What's your gear selection look like? Well, for, for one thing, <laughs> you're usually going to come away knowing what holster that either that your holster that you have cannot withstand a roll on the ground. And if you, if it did, you're cool. But at the same time, like this, this is a tentacore holster and, and I know full well, this will make it, but th that's one of the main things is you, you're, yeah, you're or, not, or, 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 you know, what you also know is if that your, 
you're using deep concealment methodology that maybe that holster isn't to that level. Yeah. What you really have to be careful with on, you know, what the, what the weaknesses are too. Yeah. You know, it's funny, like, uh, you know, a perfect example, you know, you'll see Chuck and I advocate a lot for, with people looking for, you know, sort of a minimalist basic. And he said, you know, it's hard to go wrong with either a, you know, a J frame or an LCR or something similar in a dark star gear Apollo, for example. Mm -hmm. Well, Chuck and I know that because Chuck and I both ran J frames in a dark star gear Apollos through Cecil's class. Yeah. You know, where you're rolling, you're doing all the stuff. And the class we did, it was on dirt. We weren't even rolling on mats. I mean, we were rolling on the real thing. It was Mm -hmm. pretty brutal weekend. And, you know, we can sit there and go, you know, the gear will hold up. Um, the concept holds up the, you can get the guns deployed that we didn't suffer any issues with not a matter of fact, we, we, we were able to do things with the snubs. Most people weren't with the semi autos. Mm-hmm. Um, Chuck was making a habit of taking semi autos away from everybody. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we weren't losing our snubs. There's not much to grab onto, oh, you know? Yeah. So we get out and we actually test this stuff under hard conditions, but you know, you're never going to be successful if you don't test yourself and test your gear and test that under extremely difficult conditions. And this, this is just, this class is just brain difficult, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, more Mm -hmm. so than it is anything else. I would agree for sure. Well, so you're bringing me up to something I would at least like to cover real quick before we have to go. Um, Daryl, so that, that is one thing that you're fairly well known for. And that's what got me interested in you was a, I don't even forgive me what podcast it was. I was probably just looking for something different to listen to. And, and it was you and another gentleman, and maybe it was Wayne Dobbs, but where you guys were talking in depth about snub nose revolvers and not just snub nose revolvers but snub nose revolvers with with cartridges that maybe lots of people would think are inadequate so um and and of course everything you put forth in this class and and on that podcast and your experience that a lot of times that's what you need it's actually the perfect tool and all that you may need so if you could, if you could just touch on that a little bit and sure, and- you know, we, um, again, because we do this stuff in this sort of very high level reality based stuff. And, you know, Craig Douglas will tell you the same thing. If you told Craig, I'm going to bring a snub revolver to ECQC, you know, Craig wouldn't tell you, oh, you're going to fail massively. Mm-mm. You'd be like, you know, whatever, you'll be fine. You know, you know, the reality is you're going to, you're going to be just fine. Uh, cause that thing ain't going to, and also they're not going to malfunction like a lot of the guns do yeah. when they're shot in space, shot against bodies, shot inside yeah, of cars, exploded. you know? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, one of the things is I, having been around a long time and having had, you know, you know, this whole bad Santa thing, you know, <laughs> it's a thing. You know, Santa, Santa's old. Um, but being around a long time and who I was taught by, see, we didn't have, you know, when I was coming up, we had gun magazines and going out and actually training with people. That's what we had, you know, mm-hmm. and you sort of figured out pretty quick that most of the gun magazines were, were fairly full of BS. Mm-hmm. Like it's no different today, but what you did get was like really listening and, and being mentored by guys. And so I got some of the best mentoring money could buy on like the big gun stuff, the tactics, the, the service size guns from, yeah, you know, there was no better in the world at the time than LAPD D team period. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, when I was out there, LAPD SWAT was the top, top tier there was. And I've trained with most of the big teams on those guns, the tactics, how to, how to offensively use a pistol. If that makes mm-hmm. sense, yeah. you know, where you're taking a pistol into trouble. You know, yeah. and that's all well and good, but 
what a lot of people don't realize is because I started in the equipment business. I worked at a police equipment store in San Diego in the 80s that was sort of the place to go for a lot of the the, the really good folks. Um, you know, I can tell people I sold SEAL Team 5 their SIGs before the Navy bought them. So, <laughs> you know, that was my level of customers and all – the old narcs of the 70s are treasure troves of information of how to carry a concealed firearm and what to carry. Because we don't do narcotics work like they did back then. I mean, guys that go for years working deep, deep, uh, immersed in criminal dumb. You know, now we send a CIM, buy dope, we've got the surveillance equipment, recording. I mean, we don't do investigations like that anymore where we, we turn turn a cop into a dirt bag and they go live amongst dirt bags for years. We just don't do that anymore. We had guys back then who had decades of doing that. And I had access to guys who had worked the Cold War. You know, we get all excited about ISIS and Al-Qaeda. Um, the Russians and the East Germans and the Chinese were a different ballgame hmm. of level of badassery in those Cold War era. So I had access to a lot of guys carrying guns with a lot of consequences if they were ever discovered. Mm-hmm. And they were experts at using little guns. And some of these were little tiny cartridges. You know, I tell people, I go, high standard, uh, you know, the high standard Derringers and 22 Mag. And that was like the pocket gun of the seven. I mean, all the dope guys and undercovers and a lot of cops, that was a second and third gun, was these two shot Derringers and 22 mm-hmm. Mag. And they were devastatingly effective in how they used them and deployed them. And they were easy to hide in the clothing of the day, which the jeans were tight, no belts, you know, a lot of the, that style of clothing. Um, you know, that was the, the snub you know, pocket gun. The snubs were appendix guns, you know, the little J frames and detective specials and, you know, two inch model tens and stuff. Th- those were appendix guns. And the high standards were the pocket guns. You know, I mean, Ah. that's kind of how that ran. So these guys worked that, and they didn't have all these big horrendous issues with that stuff. There's a lot to learn from those folks about deep concealment, because what's the consequence of being made? Uh, You you get killed. You get ex. You get executed. Yeah. Is the whether whether you know you're overseas somewhere and get made. Or you're in, you know, some housing project in a in a major city, with no backup, no help, you know, nothing, and you get made, you, you're just getting executed. Mm-hmm. That's a big consequence. I learned a ton from those guys, and then you know, as I told the class, working working a year of vice, where I was picking up hookers for a year, um, you know, the first thing they do is pat you in very unsocially acceptable way to find a weapon on you. And you can't get hinked about it because, again, you're supposed to be getting naked here in a minute. You're going to pay her for this in a second. And so getting weird because she's reaching inside your pants or checking your waistline or something. You know, I really learned a lot about concealment, and I found these little guns are much easier to conceal. Well, then we add shooting them efficiently, and you'll find it's a lot. 38 special out of a snub is a difficult gun to shoot, particularly the air weights and the air lights. Yeah. Those guns in 32 longs, those guns in 22 mag and those guns in 22 are much more shootable. The problem we've always had is those rounds have been very inefficient at penetrating deep with the exception of the 22 mag. Um, but like 38, 22s, a lot of that, particularly the 22s, they had they really, really underpowered for penetration, bullet construction with like lead round nose, you know, not real good. Well, our bullet technology now is to the point like with 22 punch velocitors, we blow that stuff through sternum skulls, four layers of denim, complete blocks of gel. We have 32 long rounds, like at a Buffalo bore, hard cast 32, you know, uh, 
trunk, you know, uh, flat points and the wad cutters, you know, that, that perform within FBI standards easily through four layer denim tests, which is one we really like to look at. And I'm like, if they'll do that, that's really all I need. If my accuracy is good. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to be much more accurate in a gun. I can control, I can recover. It doesn't hurt every time I pull the trigger, mm-hmm. which means I'll go practice with it. Um, you know, it's a very good system to use and it works. And here's the main thing. Those guns don't tend to fail in these kind of environments. And they also draw well out of the places we like to hide them, like pockets, ankles, deep appendix, all of that. They tend not to hang purses. Uh, they tend not to hang up. They tend to be less dangerous as far as the triggers if they do get hung. Like, I will not put a Glock in my pocket. Just won't do it. Yeah. I know you can carry a forty two in your pocket or a forty three. Can be done. No problem. Uh, six three six. The back of those guns are square. Yeah. When you deploy them and they snag, they're going to be snagged hard. And what, what's your, in the middle of a crisis, what are you going to do? Pull harder. That's where fingers get into triggers and they go yeah. bang. Where the, yeah. a lot of these snubs are shaped better and work better out of the pockets where a lot of these small autos really, really have taken their place as appendix guns. All of this needs to get taken into account. And as you saw, can I access the gun? Can I get it into play? And then can it, does it have sufficient penetration if I do my job and hit with it? You'll notice most of the guys shooting the 22s, how, how, how hard were their accuracy issues? Not hard. No, it's their easy guns to shoot. Yeah. They, you know, they don't recoil. Yeah. You're shooting a recoilless system, so you're getting this little bap, bap, you know, and it's like, you're, you're not living through that with a 22, you know, yeah. and any dreams that it knocks people off their feet, you know, where, where they lose sufficient issues. The only issue is they don't hurt as bad or they don't have as much uh, oomph when they hit hard things like big bones. Yeah. You know, from my time of actually going to autopsies, lots of shootings, working for an agency where we carried big bore guns, you know, 45 Colt, 45 ACP, any of these big bore rounds, they start hitting femurs and they break femurs and that stuff is horrifically painful on the receiving end where a 22 long may not be. Yeah. But if we're looking for here and here, if we can get it in, they scramble just as hard as anything else. Yeah. And so now do I have a little tiny system that I can better get into the acceptable target? That's really what matters more than what, you know, the gun fad of the week is on what you have to have to be minimally armed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and you got to start drawing distinctions between we all like these go to trouble guns where what we're teaching in this class is get out of trouble guns. <laughs> and that's and you awesome gotta kind of draw and you gotta kind of draw the distinction there, but that also comes with a mindset that we talked about in class. Like when you're mm-hmm. carrying these little guns, uh nobody else's problems are your problems. Yeah. They're for your problems. They are to get you out of your problems, not to go to other people's problems. And you know, again, that becomes a big mindset. Uh, issue that we tried to also correct in this class of it's okay to carry these guns, but you got to fix your mindset with them correctly that the mission changes, the mindset changes. So, you know, hopefully everybody got something out of that to where they don't have to be your primary thing, but there's a time and a place. And once you go to them, it's a different story. Um, if I can add one thing, so a real good friend of mine, Dave Dolan, retired out of LAPD. Uh, Dave and I teach together at Revolver Roundup. I got all these guys I kind of teach with. I, I have more fun teaching with people. Yeah. So Dave and I are partnered up. Deep, deep, deep level of experience with Dave. So Dave and I are in a similar place in life. We're similar age, real similar experiences. And we're both big dudes who are horribly broken. Like lots of injuries, horribly broken. Dave and I don't run anymore. 
you know, if you looked at us, you'd say, yeah, they're in okay shape for old guys, but, you know, we're not on a mat, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you know, 30 hours a week or any of that other stuff. And we've both kind of been down this pathway on these little guns. He just, we almost build them at the same time. Our whole mentality changed with the injuries that we have where we can't run anymore. Mm-hmm. And fighting is 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 wrought with potential damage. Like my entire left leg is held together literally by three strings. And wow. I have no feeling in my left foot. I mean, it, I'm not doing a lot, you know. So our new thing is, in the old days, we used to carry a lot of stuff. And we would downgrade our gear based on needing the concealment side. So we would always carry like you know, almost full-size guns, gears, spare mags, all the stuff. And then if the situation dictated, we might down that to fit the scenario. Mm -hmm. Now what we do is we carry stuff that I can be armed from the second I wake up till the second I go to bed in whatever I'm wearing, and then we upgun as the situation needed. It is more critical for us to be armed on our person at every minute. And it's a different mindset. But with that comes, we also don't get involved in as much stuff as we would have before. I mean, I can use a perfect example. I'm wearing gym shorts right now. 351C with a clip on it. Literally, this thing goes on in the morning and comes off at night. Awesome. Is it a great gun? No. Every one of these has got bugs in them, and you got to get them out. And they're once you get them to work, they're good. But, you know, it's a 22 Magnum. But it's 12, this entire package loaded right now is 12 and a half ounces. Wow. I have no excuse not to have this on my person All from the time. the time I wake up to the time I go to bed. Yeah, and you know, when I leave, I'll strap, you know, if I leave the house and put pants on and a belt and stuff, I'll throw a 365 on with a dot, and I got a 22 revolver in my pocket. But for walking around gym shorts, this is pretty sufficient, you know, for yeah. most of my life. Yeah. And again, it's sort of changing that mindset, but how limited am I to what I can go get involved in? I'm pretty limited. Yeah. So this will dictate my mindset for the day of how involved in your problems I need to be. Yeah. You know, if I go to work on a security job and I got the war belt on and the, you know, full size gun and the red dot and the knives and, pepper spray and all the junk. Now I'm more like, and somebody's paying me for it. I'm more likely to go get involved in your problems. Mm-hmm. But these things set the mindset to mind your own. And because the, of the caliber stuff, you better hit hard in the right place. Yeah. You know, you want yeah. deep penetration ammo and you want it to go right where you need it to go. Well, I, I can attest to, So two things, I I witnessed how accurate you could be with that. Um, I think maybe you were shooting because you were, and that's another thing you were shooting (laughs) along with us in that, um, especially that first iteration. Yeah, I was evaluating a a new gun that ended up breaking at the end, but it was great right (laughs) till it happened. (laughs) Well, but so so I can attest to, um, you let me, um, shoot your LCR 22 and, and that was another fun thing. And aside, we all kind of at the end got together and kind of just plinked a little bit, trying out everybody's different guns. Yeah. But I, I tried your LCRs and man, I was yanking that trigger because I was not used to, cause it's a pretty hefty trigger. It's four is 14 pounds. Yeah. And, and, but rightly so, like you said, it, it's a lot safer trigger, especially if you're, you know, having to, rush it out of a pocket but and i was it, when i was shooting in that i was thinking man daryl really knows how to run these triggers because i sure as heck can't <laughs> yeah and you know that's it's art you know we do revolver roundup now every year out at gun site and you know the thing is so my circle of people with the revolver stuff if you can shoot a double action revolver mm-hmm. you can shoot anything well yeah. I do all my dry practice okay. with a double action revolver because if I'm good with that, you know, this 365 trigger feels like a match gun. You know, I'm like, 
you know, this guy's away. I got this little hiccup in my, you know, two and three quarter pound trigger. I'm like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's your word. Yeah. Yeah. Learn how to press a trigger, pal. You know, that's just, and you know, but those triggers. So we call those heavy double action triggers, whether they're in a revolver or an auto or like the HK lamb. Uh, yeah, you know, we call those thinking triggers. So long uh, movement triggers mm-hmm. are thinking triggers. Would if you have been limited on any of those, were you shooting faster than your trigger speed on any of those problems? Oh, uh-uh. no, they're thinking triggers for thinking problems. Yeah. That's I like good. to call like the double action, single action guns is you have a thinking trigger when you have, need a thinking trigger and you yeah. got a shooting trigger when you need a shooting trigger. That's <laughs> kind of why I really like those, those Langdon Berettas, you know? So, you know, you, you end up, and most of my career, I carried a double action, single action gun for more than anything else. So I'm kind of used to them, but you know, I found them on the street, you know, we're fine. You know, last shooting I was in was with a DA, uh, semi auto on, I couldn't have told you what the trigger weight was. I just knew I had to be smooth on it and be able to listen, pat myself on the back. It was an exceptionally good shot where I planned on firing a pair and the guy went down so hard in one that I didn't need the second shot. But I, I certainly wasn't handicapped by the trigger. What I was handicapped by was I had a horrifically difficult decision-making process mm. in a dark bar where everybody looked like a suspect. And there was also backstop and front stop issues all over the place. Wow. And you know, that, 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 that double action trigger on my gun was not a horrific handicap that couldn't be overcome. And it, it the, the trigger weight didn't matter. None of that stuff mattered. You know, um, the, uh, I, I referred in the, in the class, you know, before to John Helms, who I use as a, one of my mentors, you know, probably greatest living gunfighter amongst us. And, you know, John told me one time in a conversation, you know, he goes, look, all I need is a, a, a gun with a, a trigger I can manage, sights I can see, and it needs to be reliable. Other than that, I don't care. You know, for most of us, we were issued guns or restrictive on the guns our whole lives that we we're out, you know, hunting felons with. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so we, a lot of us don't get real hung up on a lot of the, well, this weight trigger, this kind of, you know, can I manage the trigger? Yes or no. Has it got some sights I can see? And does it go bang in all the situations I needed to go bang and into? And it's like, okay, from there, start problem solving. Yeah. Yeah. You know, well, quit getting all hung up about the gun. I'll tell you what, that that's a very, very good, good place to start wrapping up because what you just let me put a fine point on this daryl what you explained in that real world scenario where where you said you had to take one shot during making a complicated um decision you had to make several c scenario i mean c cycles and that's s e e right c evaluate eliminate and then you you literally just described the type of scenario similar to what you had us run through in a in in the drills so that that's an interesting way that that you would tell that right at the end here so um now Daryl it, it all it, it all came from somewhere <laughs> yes sir clearly so that's why it's it clearly a, came it clearly came from somewhere. <laughs> that, that's yep. why it's a it's a it's a proper mic drop situation yeah. now. But I, I'm gonna say it, you know what, real, can I, real 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 oh, real yeah. quick. Let me add something to that. Let's hear it. No attorney, never prosecuted in policy, uh, immediate uh, dismissal by the DA's office. No civil liability. No nothing because the shooting was that good. Awesome. On a minority in Southern California under the Ninth Circuit. So again, you know, if you can process this stuff right, it can go really well for you. You know, with so you're, with you're one saying, and done all right. <laughs> yeah. So you're saying it, it, with the right processing, you can even win in the Ninth Circus 
Court of Appeals. Yeah. <laughs> well, it never went to the ninth, but we're. Oh, we're, I know. I, I'm. We're, what, no, from where I was at, though, we had to use the Ninth Circuit rulings. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. As a guy, as, as, as a guide to what you can do. Yeah, and of do, course, I'm. You know, I'm making. <laughs> I'm poking a little bit of. Oh fun no, there I, at the ninth they, Circuit. They, they they need it. It's it's if you can get it by anything in the ninth, you're doing something right. You know, because that'll fly anywhere else. (laughs) Uh, Yes. Well, so I want to say just real quick, and and then I have one more question. But before I say that, I do want to make sure that people understand that what we've been talking about is the class with with you, Daryl Bokey, Chris, excuse me, Chuck Haggard and Cecil Birch. It was the MPE counter robbery class. I highly recommend r- recommend it. It was an excellent class. I was uh, elated to have been able to go to get through it, to learn a ton. And, and I would just encourage you as a listener to make sure you check out everything that all three of those individuals have to offer, because no matter the class, now that I've gone through classes with all three of them, I can guarantee you that you're going to learn something. Now, one and I we don't have time to get into it either, but I wanted to make this very important point too about the class is that you guys also gave an excellent presentation of the smaller guns you carry, how you carry them, the holsters, the pocket holsters, everything from that on into very, very unassuming weapons that you can um carry anywhere, including on flights but that's a another i think people need to go to your class to get that information because it was so illustrative seeing it um firsthand so so now we are at the point daryl that all of our first time guests because we usually have guests back about three or four times at least but the first time we have you guys on this is the most important question of the show and it is what are your three favorite bands and or musical artists? Gosh. ACDC. Um, probably Kansas. I've been to more Kansas concerts than anything else. And God, a third would be tough. I have some bizarre if you looked at my playlist on my stuff, it's absolutely bizarre. I'm well, just going to keep it to the rock. Right there. I'm going to keep it to the rock stuff, but I do country, folk stuff, uh, all sorts of crazy stuff that I listen to all the time. But on straight rock bands, and then probably Sabaton. Sabaton. Yeah, I, I'll take. I'm. I'm. You're. You're catching me off guard here. I'm. I'm pretty versed. Oh in my music. god. It, oh. Oh my gosh. If you are involved in any of this and have not immersed yourself in Sabaton, you are just wrong. Uh, uh, just well, wrong. I am wrong. I am wrong. You're, you're, the, it's all based on uh, military historical battle stuff. And my favorite song is uh, Winged Hussars. Say that one more time. Favorite song is Winged Hussars by Sabaton uh, of wow. theirs. Well, it's a I've story got... of saving my my Polish winged hussars saving Christendom. Oh wow! I can't believe you've never heard of Sabaton. Oh, am it, I okay it... with am I okay with ACDC? Right? <laughs> oh, oh, of course. Look around the room here. I'm I'm a rock guitar player for sure. You, you so you, oh, you, you said... have you have you had have you had Easter John? Um, no. You gotta I... have Easter. You gotta have Easter John to talk about guitars. Okay. I just lived in his, uh, when I'm working in Oklahoma, I've been living at Brian's house among all the amps and guitars. Like he actually played in bands and stuff. I mean, he's okay. He's a so, serious rock guitarist. Yeah. Okay. So, well then, then if you don't mind hooking me up with him, because yes, that would be yep. a blast, you know, cause Absolutely. The, you know, that that's one of the aspects and that's why we asked this question, because for one thing, everybody's heard, not everybody, but Lots of people have heard you talk about your revolvers, but I wonder how many people have heard you talk about your favorite bands, right? So that that's one of the, 
That's one of the reasons why we're bringing it up. Because I'm, I'm the most non-musical human on the planet. I can't play anything. Oh, no, 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 no. But, it, it, I, I would rather play... Well, okay, let me put it this way. I am as much of a music fan, give me something great to crank up in my car stereo, as I am a guitar player. So to me, the, the experience of music as a musician or a fan or just a listener... Oh man, it's it. Very rarely do we ask that question and someone not show that they love music. I can count. Well, you know, on, it's funny. So, so can I give you an accomplishment? A gun and music accomplishment. Let's hear it. So I was driving home from Shot Show, and I I went through every single ACDC song ever recorded chronologically. Wow. And I think I was all, I was within probably two hours of Dallas. And I got to tell you, I couldn't wait to get some country music on. I'm just switching that up. But it was quite <laughs> the accomplishment of going, of, of every single song front to back was pretty, pretty, pretty crazy. So, so that was just some, some goal you set forth for yourself. For yeah, I just decided that, uh, yeah, that I'm driving home from SHOT Show all by myself. I am going to, from the very first recorded song to the very last, do the entire ACDC playlist. And again, it took from Vegas to almost Dallas to get through it. Oh, wow. That's cool. <laughs> There's a very, lot there. Very <laughs> There's cool. There's a lot there. Well, it doesn't, it, you know... There's a reason why when people think of rock guitar that Angus Young comes to mind. So that that's excellent. Well, Daryl, I appreciate your time. I was really excited that you were wanting to come on when I asked you the other day. So I'm glad. Um, this may be one of the, the quickest turnarounds we've ever had where I ask someone to come on <laughs> and then you get to come on. And the very fact that I just got to take an excellent class and learn from you just several days ago. So thank you. Yeah, again. we were eating... We were we were eating chicken fried steak what two days ago so you know oh yeah and boy or, that or was chicken some, a chicken yeah <laughs> oh that was some good southern southern food for sure I'm glad you guys yep. um suggested going there well Daryl you have a good evening um thank you for your time and I definitely look forward to taking classes from you in the future and if you'd like to come back on that'd be great too anytime all right buddy you have a good evening. You too. Thanks, Aaron.